The 7950X3D has launched and I see so much misunderstanding and misinformation about parked processes and parked cores and CPU masking and affinity and the scheduler and so I saw a couple of posts was like, oh, just disable the core parking thing. No, the core parking thing mostly works correctly at this point. It doesn't always. It will get better with time, but core parking makes the most sense from a computer science standpoint. Let's dive in. As long as what you're doing mostly fits in the cache on a given set of CPUs, it makes more sense to have fewer cores active than more cores active when you are latency sensitive in what you're doing. And most of the time you will be latency sensitive in what you're doing when we're talking about gaming. Windows doesn't make it super easy to understand what's going on under the hood in a lot of cases. It took a lot of work for me to figure out way back in the day that the Windows scheduler was most of the problem with the Threadripper 2990WX. And that was because Windows kept moving processes to try to be closer to memory, but for half of the, the cores, it was they were never gonna get closer to memory. It was just a bug in the scheduler. Things have progressed a lot since then, actually, very rapidly, especially when we're talking about Windows 11 and the Windows Game Bar and the fact that we have to deal with CPUs that are not perfectly symmetrical, very asymmetrical in the case of Team Blue, but now also in the case of Team Red in that one of our CCDs has more cache than the other one. And this isn't a bad thing, and core parking is not a dirty word. If you want to dive into this a little bit more, you can run Resource Monitor and hit the CPU tab at the top. You'll get a list of your CPUs. There's 32, remember, 16 cores, 32 threads. And you'll notice that some of the cores say parked. What does that mean? That means they're basically turned off. Some of the extensions and configuration and everything from AMD mean that you could have your system configured for the balanced power profile, and you could be in a situation where when you're not in a game, all of your cores are active, but when you launch a game, only the cores the game needs will be active and everything else will be parked. A lot of people jump to the conclusion that if you had a lot of background tasks running, that meant that you would be in a worse position as far as performance. But nothing could be farther from the truth because with core parking, if your system's busy, it's gonna wake up the cores. They're gonna do work and they're gonna be able to do stuff. That's what, that's what we're doing here. The easiest way for me to demonstrate this is with Factorial. It's an indie game and it's a gem. It doesn't even matter about the graphics. You could run it on potato class graphics. But Factorio, let's, 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 let's take a deeper look here. It's possible to benchmark Factorio from the command line. And Factorio, if you haven't played it, it's not about the graphics, it's about the gameplay. Very CPU heavy. And when you get to a large factory that has a lot of robots and a logistics network and a train system and it's fighting the alien insect things, uh, it can take a long time and it, it's less enjoyable if your computer can't keep up. If we do Windows G while we're running Factorio, especially the benchmark from the command line, the Windows Game Bar doesn't really even detect that a game is running. And in our configuration here with this system, you know, we're running Resource Monitor like I was showing you, and in Resource Monitor, it just has all the CPUs, and it doesn't say that any particular CPU core is parked. When you run a game, the game will use all available CPUs, but the games typically aren't super well optimized, and so a lot of the time a game will prefer either a lot of frequency, in which case it makes sense to put the game on the CCD that doesn't have the V cache, or a game will prefer to have lots of cache. In Factorio's case, it prefers to have a lot of cache. And so by default, Factorio will try to use all threads across the entire system. And that's what we have in our first benchmark here. And this is showing us that it's about, you know, 2700 milliseconds, 2500 milliseconds, 2700 milliseconds you know, doing a thousand updates. And if we look at Task Manager, uh, from that view, we can see that it's using all 16 cores for this kind of a benchmark. So while it's running this benchmark, but don't do anything, it looks kind of weird. It looks like it's only using a single core, and it looks like it's core three, 27, 2600 milliseconds, five to 9% utilization. There's really not a lot going on here. And it says the map was benchmarked at 377 updates per second. But that's, you know, if you run it a bunch of times, the result will actually be pretty varied. But let's do that again with a very slight difference. I'm gonna go to details 
And I'm gonna wait for Factorio to pop up in the list here. I'm sorting by CPU. And we're gonna go to set affinity. And we're gonna turn it off for all processors. And we're only gonna set it for the first 15 processors. Remember 16 cores, 32 threads. And I didn't do that fast enough because I'm doing this for video, but it, you know, it was 2600 milliseconds and then, oh, it immediately drops down to 2500 milliseconds. And as we see this run a couple of more times, it'll be 2400 milliseconds and we'll, we will be over 400 updates per second. And so we've manually picked which uh, cores that our particular game runs on. And so that's what the Xbox game bar is supposed to do for us in terms of core parking and moving the process around. Now this is, uh, strictly speaking, when we talk about affinity, it's not really the same as core parking. You see, what core parking does is it says, hmm, this game is only using one core. We don't really need to bounce the process around to different cores. We can actually just have it run on one core. And by doing that, you avoid micro stutters and creating a situation where information has to be offloaded from one CPU and shuttled to another. There's a lot of stuff in a CPU core that is designed to cache stuff from main memory because the mechanism of the computer really depends on having very close, fast, local access to the data. And the, the cache, like the L1 cache, the L2 cache, and the L3 cache that are on the processor are much faster than main memory. But moving stuff from one processor to another usually doesn't have too much of a penalty, especially with AMD's architecture with the level three. What's really important to understand is that the scheduler uh, has to make a judgment call between how busy is the system, or is the system reasonably so busy that it would benefit from waking up other cores which have access to uh, their own level one and level two cache, or is the stuff that we're doing right now not complicated enough that we'll live entirely in that level three cache. And so just running Windows background tasks and games like Factorio, that'll fit pretty comfortably in 96 megabytes of L3 cache. And the level of optimization in Factorio is such that you know, it benefits from having access to that extra L3 cache. And Factorio is not really multi-threaded enough that it benefits from having access to the other eight cores versus having everything be local in that 96 megabytes of cache. So uh, that's sort of the geometry of this process. So when I talk about what is the geometry of the application that we're running, these are things that it would be nice for the scheduler to keep in mind. If you're playing a game and you notice a micro stutter, that is sometimes a symptom of the fact that something in the background caused a process to move from one core to another. And so the game and the operating system really need to communicate with one another uh, at a pretty high level. And the scheduler is also something where it's very easy um, to get wrong. There are, uh, the operating system engineers that can work on a scheduler competently are very few and far between and requires a very high level of skill. Then Intel entered the game with their heterogeneous cores, meaning that you have big cores and you have little cores and those behave differently. And that's definitely something the scheduler should take in mind because if your game gets shunted from a high performance core to an efficiency core because of other stuff going on in the system, then you're in a situation where you're definitely gonna feel a micro stutter. And core parking and the Windows game bar is Microsoft's reasonable attempt to deal with this in a sane way. And AMD has of course extended that on their own uh, for the slight asymmetry of the 7950X 3D. And so even though you have more cache on one processor than another, at the end of the day, the cores are still basically the same. And so in the specific case of Factorio, understand what's happening here. The reason that our score improves so much, I mean, from 377 to 412 or 419 or 420, 435, uh, depending on what you do. Uh, the reason that's such a dramatic improvement is not because of core parking or the Windows game bar or it's like, oh, I nudged the Windows game bar into working like it should. It's strictly an affinity mask. And that's a different mechanism than core parking. Affinity mask says this process must only run on these specific cores. And so I've manually picked cores that it runs on. And the affinity mask keeps the process from moving around. It ensures that that process never runs on a core that doesn't have vCache. Now, this actually would be worse for performance if you had a lot of other stuff running that also needed vCache cores. You would get better performance out of Factorio if you moved Factorio to the non-vCache cores, assuming that you had something else competing for resources on the vCache cores. But 
at a, at a sort of microscopic high level, when we're dealing with processors that have 12 or 16 or 24 cores, this is sort of becoming new computer science. We're gonna enter an era where the operating system has a radically different scheduler depending on how many threads your processor has. We already see in the enterprise, you know, servers that have 32, 64, 96, 192 cores, where a couple of cores will be reserved for the operating system. And so things that are running at system level or root level, they just live on those two cores. and. They're reserved. They're not, I mean, it's not exactly accurate to call it reserved, but they're they're basically reserved. And then individual applications don't really shuffle around too much. We see this with VMware, with Hyper-V, uh, to a lesser extent, some of the other virtualization technologies, but all of these things are being done to squeeze as much performance as humanly possible out of the hardware. And with desktop computers as powerful, you know, when they're based around processors like the 7950X3D, this kind of approach makes more sense than just all cores on all the time and things can bounce back and forth between them. In fact, a lot of the gaming performance anomalies that we've seen over the last two or three or four years since, you know, processors that weren't exactly identical or processors that had a large shared L3 cache, a lot of the 1% lows and 0.1% low anomalies come from uh, these kinds of situations where uh, uh, there's a major cache miss or something wasn't prefetched from main memory or something is not optimized and the processor has to stall while waiting on something else in a pipeline somewhere else in order to deal with it. So we're on a path to, to resolve this the correct way. Core parking overall as a strategy to deal with this makes sense to me. And generally, I don't think you should disable core parking or anything like that. But this is why it's important to use a balanced profile as opposed to high performance, because in some scenarios, high performance will prevent your cores from parking when Windows detects you're, you're kind of using a mixed workload. But this also doesn't mean that you lose background capabilities if core parking is in use. If you're running OBS to do capturing, the Windows Scheduler plus Game Bar is smart enough to know, oh, okay, this is OBS. I, OBS doesn't care. I'm gonna try to keep OBS away from wherever the game is running. The game can run on the vCache side, and OBS is gonna keep the other cores, uh, you know, sort of busy. And so OBS might only use one or two cores, and so it would still be the case that you have other parked cores on the other CCD, and Windows will do that to try to keep processes from migrating over there. The affinity mask is like a hard, no, you must not do this. And what Windows Game Bar is doing is a little softer, but ultimately a very similar mechanism and very similar outcomes to what we're doing here. And so when you look at the performance delta in Factorio, you can really see this as a window into what's going on in other games. And also I, I think it's, it's unnecessary to do things like disable the non vCache CCD. You just don't need to do it. The reason that you have a, a game here and there that performs wildly differently when you disable the non-vcache CCD is just a software thing. It's just a configuration thing. You can fix it yourself in the Windows Game Bar. You can fix it by editing the registry and tweaking some stuff. You could use Process Lasso. You can do what I did and, and set the affinity mask. You generally shouldn't have to do that. I mean, you, you only really want to do that if you're a gearhead or you're tweaking or you want to improve things. But as a casual gamer, you don't have to worry about any of that. And fortunately, it's broken on both kinds of systems if you want to look at it that way. At this level of performance, this level of optimization, no matter what kind of a system you have, you will get better performance out of this game or that game uh, if you take the learnings from here and apply it because if you get a high-end Intel CPU, you've got a similar set of problems. At the end of the day, latency and bandwidth are the names of the game, and anything that you can do to maximize the opportunity for a game to have a consistent high bandwidth, low latency experience on your platform, the better overall everything else is going to run. Now a game like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it's uninteresting. The scheduler's aware of it, the Windows Game Bar's aware of it, everything sort of works as advertised. You can get almost 400 FPS out of it on the 7950X 3D. Okay, pretty cool. But what about Borderlands 3? You know, Borderlands 3, our results sort of lagged behind the uh, results from Intel. But if we use a combination of core parking and the manual affinity masking, can we eke out some more performance from Borderlands 3? About 99 FPS on our 7900 XTX 
So for the next round of benchmarks, I've disabled core parking and I've just used the affinity mask thing so that Borderlands will only run on the cores that are on the Vcache CCD. The threads on the Vcache CCD, I should say. So Borderlands 3 doesn't really benefit from playing around with uh, all of the obvious things as far as masking and core affinity and, and that sort of thing go. It probably has some sort of deeper issue like if AMD disable FMA or something silly like that. While I can't improve the overall benchmark score with Borderlands 3, I can make the 1% lows or 0.1% lows considerably worse by messing with affinity and core priority. By forcing the game to run in a sort of suboptimal situation as far as cores and threads and core parking go, I've made a much worse gaming experience. And yes, this is, you know, operator error when the operator is an idiot, but sometimes these kinds of obvious mistakes exist in the operating system or in the game itself where the game programmers need to make some changes to do some optimization or performance enhancements or fixes that'll lead to uh, less performance issues, let's say. And when you get right down to it, there's a whole host of other benefits from core parking and the change in general strategy, not just the architectural issue, not just with cache, also power. Uh, a lot of the time, the cores can't boost as high unless they have the power budget available. And a parked core is in pretty much its lowest power state. It's gonna create more power available for all their cores. And that's agnostic of platform. It doesn't matter what kind of a CPU that you're running, that's gonna be true no matter what, if it has these kinds of features. And more power being available also generally tends to mean more thermal headroom as well. So if you're constrained on thermals or constrained on power, the fact that the cores that you're not using are parked is going to lead to a better situation in terms of opportunistic boosting, in terms of frequency boosting, in terms of being able to just use a little bit more power, just get a little bit better performance, because a lot of things like games don't really scale that well to a bajillion different cores. And if you're wondering about all of this machinery for other CPUs like the 7800X3D, no, you're not gonna need any of this machinery. But also look at the max boost clock on that 7800X3D. It is quite a bit lower than the 7900X3D and the 7950X3D because it doesn't have the other CCD to do the boosting. And so yes, it's going to be less software overhead and, and that sort of thing. If you're running games that mostly benefit from the larger cache, then the 7800X3D is probably still gonna pull ahead, but if you have games and other stuff that benefit from frequency, you're at least gonna have eight cores that will boost to those really high frequencies in the 7950X3D. And that's sort of the situation that we find ourselves in. It's not anything like you're gonna lose performance because you've got parked cores or anything like that. The core parking thing is to do with a scheduling strategy, not uh, a band-aid or not a bad approach. This is the correct computer science approach for this situation for all of those reasons that I've outlined. I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been a quick look at core parking and the resource monitor, what it means for gaming and uh, the new normal that we find ourselves in. I'm Sadiat, you can find me in the level one forums.